Hi! First, I'd like to thank you for choosing to watch my presentation. I'm Matheus de Paula Ferreira, and I'm a PhD student at Universidade Federal de Goiás in Brazil. Erika Coelho and Herbert Coelho are my advisors. This work is the product of a collaboration with professors Loerbio Faria, Silviano Gravier, and Sulamita Klein. Our work is titled On the Oriented Calling of the Disjoint Union of Graphs. We will understand what each of these terms means during the course of this presentation. So let's start it. We say that a graph is a simple graph when we don't have two edges, two different edges, that have the same two vertexes on both of its ends. So, and we don't have an edge that have the same vertex on both sides. And that is what we call a simple graph. An oriented graph is an orientation of a simple graph. See, we define that this edge, for instance, goes from this vertex from this vertex. So we are defining an orientation for each of the edges of our graph. We call uh, G arrow is the oriented version of G and we call G the underlying graph of G arrow. So here we will define the, our problem. What we are working on this paper. We say that an oriented k-coloring can be seen as a subdivision of the vertexes of my graph in k independent sets in a manner that all the edges that connect those sets are in the same directions. In other words, I can understand an oriented k-coloring as a function from the vertexes of G to 1, 2, 3, until K. And this function respects these two rules. If X and Y is an, is an edge in G arrow, then the colors of X and the colors of Y are different. If X, Y, and Z and T are an edge in G arrow and the color of X is equal to the color of T, then we have that the color of Y needs to be different from the color of Z. So what can we see from the second rule? If we have a path of size 2, the first and the last vertex of, the, of our path needs to have different colors. But it's not only on local paths, right? Because we need to look of all the colors on the graph. So we can have these paths of size 2 in other sides of the graph. But more on that later. The oriented chromatic number of a graph G arrow is the smallest k such that G arrow admits an oriented k coloring. So uh, the oriented chromatic number is what we call the minimal numbers of colors that we need to color a graph G. Here we present an example such that we present a four oriented coloring for our graph G. This, uh, this coloring is represented by the graph T. See that the color black connects to the color red, the color red connects to the colors yellow and blue, and the color yellow connects to the color blue. So uh, we can represent this oriented K color, this oriented four color in this case, as a graph as well. So continue with my presentation, we also need to talk about homomorphisms. An homomorphism between a graph G arrow and a graph T arrow is a function from the vertex of G to the vertex of T in a manner that we can save the structure of the arcs of my graph. Right? So 
we have that if the arc XY is an arc NG, then F, X and F, Y is an arc NT. So it's, it's the same thing. I'm preserving the structure of my, my set of arcs. Uh, when I say arcs and edges, I mean the same thing, just to make sure that's clear. So why did I use the same example of my coloration here? is to show that we have um, equivalence between a, the homomorphism problem and the oriented k-calling problem. We can see uh, oriented k-calling as an homomorphism of my graph G arrow to a graph T arrow with k vertexes, in a manner that the vertex of T represents the colors and the arcs of my graph T represents the connection between the scholars in my graph G. So when I try to color a graph G with this graph T, I can say that G is T colorable. And I can call this problem the T coloring problem. So another definition that we need to have in mind. The oriented chromatic number of a graph G so a not oriented graph is denoted by the maximum oriented chromatic number of G arrow, where G arrow is all orientation, all possible orientations of G. So here we have a, a, an example. So we have on a path of size three with no orientation. The oriented chromatic number of this path with no orientation is the biggest of the oriented chromatic number of all of its orientations. So we have an orientation that has oriented chromatic number three because we have A connecting to B and B connecting to C. So we need three colors. But if B is a sync vertex, we can color the same graph, the same path with two colors. But that won't make my oriented chromatic number smaller because I'm looking at the biggest oriented chromatic number of all of its orientations of my graph. This is also important for our work. So given a positive integer k, we denote by c and k the class of graphs g such that the oriented chromatic number of g is less than equal than k. So what are we saying here? If a graph is in the class C and 3, for instance, we know that this graph has its oriented chromatic number less than equal 3. So what I'm saying, the class C and 3 needs three colors to be, co to be colored, the class C and 4 needs four colors to be colored. So the first thing we do in this work is we characterize the class of connected and disconnected graphs that belongs to the C entry class. Remember, what's the C entry class? The class that needs three colors to be colored. From this characterization is where we found the need to study, to study the disjoint onion of graphs to study the oriented chromatic number of the joint union of graphs. So what is our motivation? Here we have two graphs, a complete graph of size 3 and a path of size 4. If I analyze each of these two graphs separately without the joint union, I can color them with three colors. Uh, it's a complete graph in A, so we know that we need three colors to color it. But here in B, we could color my path of size 4 with three colors. Why? Uh, so if I take the union of those two graphs, why can't I put the, uh, put the black color in G? Because I need to look that in my complete graph K3, I have a black vertex connecting to a yellow vertex. So I can't have a yellow vertex connecting to a black vertex. 
And that's it. that is valid for all the possible combinations of colors in P4 that we could have. The, uh, this example is just to show that I can have two graphs that separately had a smaller oriented chromatic number, but together with the union, they have a bigger chromatic number. So that's the, the main focus of our motivation for studying the disjoint union of graphs for the oriented chromatic number problem, uh, or oriented scale color. So first we would, uh, we would describe the chromatic number of the class CN3. So first I'll go through some lemmas that are needed to accomplish our results. The first one is, is a bit simple. So we, co we consider a graph G to be a connected graph with at least four vertexes. What we want to show, if G contains a K3 as a subgraph, then the oriented chromatic number of G is at least four. I'll go through the main idea of this demonstration. So if we have um, the complete graph K3 in A, B, and C, and we choose a transitive orientation for him, we can add a fourth vertex D in a manner that C connects to D. So why can't I why can't I color uh, D with colors A and B? Because I have a path of size two from A and B to D. So here is easy to see why I need four colors if I have K3 as a subgraph. So my second lemma says that if a connected graph G contains CK as a subgraph with K bigger or equal than four, then the chromatic number is <coughs> bigger or equal than four. In particular, if G contains C5 as a subgraph, then the oriented chromatic number of G is at least five. So here's the idea. Here is what the idea of this demonstration. First, we need to remember that CK is the psychograph, right? It's uh, that simple. So, what we need to think here? We know from other results in the literature that the oriented chromatic number of cycles is at most five. So, I know that, that it exists an orientation of C5 that needs five colors to be colored. So, if I have this orientation as a subgraph of my graph, I know that I already need five colors. Uh, another result that we have about cycles is that, is that I can color any cycle other than the C5 with four colors. So if I have the lower bound, consider that this lower bound is the cycle, I already know that the oriented chromatic number of my graph is going to be at least four or at least five if I have C5 as a subgraph. So now we can characterize the class of the connected graphs of, that belongs to CN3. So we say that the connected graph G belongs to CN3 if and only if G is either the complete graph K3 or a tree. So what's the idea here? If G is a cyclic, then G is a tree, right? That's the definition of the thing. And we know by other results in the literature that every tree is in CN3. So we don't need to worry about that. If G is not a cyclic, so from lemmas 1 and 2, we know that G is the graph K3. Why we know that? Because if I have a cycle that is bigger than 4, right? So if I have a cycle that is a list of size 4, I, won't, I will have the chromatic number 4. So I won't be in CN3. And if I have a graph that has K3 as a subgraph and has at least 4 vertexes, I also know that the, chromat the oriented chromatic number is at least 4. So, from these two lemmas, I know that my graph is the K3. So now, 
will will try to to describe the entire class. Here we are talking about the connected graphs. So we also go through some lemmas that will help us to describe the entirety of my class of graphs that belongs to CN3. So we go through lemma 3. Let G be a graph with key uh, connected comp components x1, x2, to x key, x q. Eh? Sorry about that. With q bigger than 2, such that the component x, y contains k3 as a subgraph for some y belonging to 1, 2, to q. Né? So I have one of my connected components contains k3 as a subgraph. That's what I need to know. If there is a component x, j in a manner that y is different than j, and that component x, j contains k3 or p4 as a subgraph, then the oriented chromatic number of this graph is at least 4. So what's the idea here? <coughs> I know that I need that I have a, a component that has k3 as a subgraph. So let's consider a, b, and c. Uh, a, b, and c it's an orientation of it's the cyclic of orientation of k3. So if we have another component containing k3 and we get like the transitive orientation of K3, we will need four colors. Why? The same idea. If I color D with black and E with red, why can't I put the color blue in F? Uh, it's because I have the color red connecting to the color blue, so I can't have the color blue connecting to the color red. So that's the idea why we can't have two K-trees in different connected components. If I have P4 as a, a, a subgraph in my connected components XJ, we go back to the same example that I said that motivated us to study the disjoint onion of graphs, right? I can't put the color black and G, because I have the color yellow, I have the color black connecting to the color yellow, so I can't have the color yellow connecting to the color black. Again, I'm gonna just highlight that I'm going through the GB graph, G belongs to CN3, if and only if G is either a forest or a complete graph K3, uh, Union with S, where S is a forest of stars. So, what's the idea behind this theorem? If G has a cycle, then by lemmas 1, 2, and 3, we know that there is at most one connected component, G, Y of G, which has a cycle as a subgraph. And in this case, we know that this component is K3. And still by lemma 3, right? just let's remember lemma 3, it's the one we talk about the connected components. Still by lemma 3, we know that the remaining components have a diameter that is less than 3. And hence, G is a disjoint union of K3 and a forest of stars. Remember that stars is a central vertex that is connected to a series of vertex around it, the, a series of leaves. Né? It's a tree that has a root that connects to a series of leaves around it. So, and if G is a cyclic, then G is a forest, and by lemma 4, we have that my forest it can be colored with at most three colors. So that is how we characterize our CN3 class. So why we wanted to study the oriented chromatic number of few graphs for the first time as we know it? We realized that no one had studied 
this parameter for this class of graphs in the literature. And we wanted to study the union of complete graphs and real graphs. But for that, we needed to define the oriented chromatic number of real graphs. A real graph, W, Q, it's, uh, we can see as a, a cycle that is connected to a central vertex in a manner that the central vertex connects to each vertex of the cycle. Uh, and we consider that the Q is the size of the outer cycle. So what, we, what did we prove? That if I have Q bigger than or equal than 8 be a positive integer, then the oriented chromatic number of WQ is at most 8. So the first thing we prove, we show that there exists um, a, a wheel graph that needs 8 colors to be colored. So we show the lower bound. To show the upper bound, we show a, a, an algorithm that can color every wheel with 8 colors. It's an extensive proof. So for time, for because of time constraints of this presentation, I will only show the main idea. And the main idea of this algorithm is when you consider an orientation in that the respective CQ has an oriented for color in which one of the colors is assigned just one vertex. So I can color my outer CQ with four, with four colors in a manner that one of these colors can be, uh, it's gonna be assigned just to one vertex. From this, <coughs> from each of the colors that can be repeated on my CQ, I will consider the oriented bipartite graph that is inducted by our WQ by the vertex if color X and the vertex C. If there are sinks and sources in this graph minus the central vertex, and if that uh, there is at least a sink of in this set, I will set the color x plus 4 to this vertex. So what's the idea? Uh, B1 minus Vc has source and sinks? No, so I don't do anything. B2 has, yes, so I set the color of this vertex to 2 plus 4. So doing by doing that, I will generate a 7 coloring to my cycle, so my cycle of my wheel. And I can put the color 4 plus 4 in my, my central vertex. In that manner, I can color every wheel with 8 colors. So to finish, we will go through the, the main study of our article. The first thing we, we want to do here, when we say that given the disjoint union of two graphs, G union T, when we say that we will take colors of G to color T, we mean that those colors can be utilized in T without creating problems in our oriented coloring. This is important, <coughs> excuse me, because all of these demonstrations are based on this. We want to take colors from my first connected component and reutilize those colors in my second connected component. So I can obtain the oriented chromatic number of the union of those two graphs. So the first result we proved is let G be a graph with two connected components, G1 and G2, whereas G1 is a complete graph Kp with P bigger than 3, and G2 is a graph such that our orientations G2, G2 arrow have an homomorphism into a directed path P3. So what this is saying? Uh, G1 is a complete graph and G2 is a graph that has an homomorphism to P3, or meaning that he can be colored to P3. So the main idea of the demonstration here is that I can always take three colors from any, any complete graph. 
So I have three complete, uh, two complete graphs of size 3. And I always have a path of size 3 here, from C to A to B, C to A to B, in both of these orientations. So if I can always take, if I can always take those three colors, I can always color my second graph, because he has an homomorphism to P3. So from this theorem, I we get to the second theorem. Whereas let G be a graph with two connected components, G1 and G2. Whereas G1 is a complete graph KP, and G2 is a graph such that orientations of G2 have an homomorphism into the directed cycle C3. So the second graph can always be colored with C3. What's the difference here? Again, we go back to the transitive orientation of my complete graph on three vertex. This transitive orientation makes that I can't utilize blue on four here, by instance, because I have blue connecting to black, black connecting to red, and I was supposed to put, to put blue on four, right? But I have blue connecting to red, so I can't have red connecting to blue. The idea is the same, is that when I have a graph that needs to be colored with C3, because of my transitive orientation, I can't use like the three colors. I need one extra color. From these two theorems, we have color R1 and 2, because given a graph G, that is the union of a complete graph with a path, a tree, and a forest, we know that we can color those with P plus 1 colors, because a path, a tree, and a forest can be colored with the directed cycle C3. And given the union between a complete graph and a star, we can color with P colors, because uh, the star can be colored with the path, the path P3. So this one is easy to see, right? Because uh, again, I, uh, what's my theorem? I have a graph G that belongs to CN4 uh, and C be a cycle. The union between this graph G and my cycle can be colored with five colors. Why? Because I need five colors to color a cycle. And I have a special tournament that can be that can color every, every graph in CN4, every graph that needs four colors to be colored. So from this, we have the following corollary. If G is a C union with another cycle of this, the union of a cycle with a path or a tree or the complete graph with four vertices, we know that this union can be colored with five vertices because of this special tournament that can color every graph in the CN4 class. So here we also analyze the, the union between a complete graph and the cycle. The interesting part of this demonstration is when P is bigger than 4, when I have a complete graph of at least 4 vertices. We show that if we need, we can always take three colors of my complete graph and use that together with one extra color to color of cycle. Uh, the last thing that we analyzed, it was the union between a comp two complete graphs. Uh, what we realized on analyzing this union, that the colors that you can take from the first complete graphs, uh, it's the subgraph that is common to both of my complete graphs. So I can say that the oriented chromatic number of my union is the size of the first complete plus the size of the second complete minus the size of this subgraph that is common to both of my graphs.
Lastly, we're gonna look at the disjoint union of a complete graph and a wheel graph. It's a bound that is easy to see. Because we know that we can take three colors for every complete graph, and we need eight colors to color any wheel. So, with the three colors that you can take from any complete graph, we subtract that from 8. So we get 2p plus 5 as the upper bound. And that's it. I would like to thank you again for watching my presentation.